right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Japan Study Abroad Information Session hosted by Green River College. And we have some of our colleagues here from other Wixa community colleges in the area. I see Cascadia and Wacom represented for sure. And I know there's a couple more out there, um, Shoreline and lots of students. Great to see you all here. I'm Megan Swanson. I'm a program manager who coordinates study abroad programs, specifically the Japan one here at Green River. So I'll be your host today. And um, I'd also like to inter introduce the other three Green River representatives who are here. So Mark, do you wanna go next? Sure, uh, my name is Mark Milston and uh, I recruit international students at Green River College and I also help support the study abroad programs with Megan. And uh, I do love study abroad. I've done it seven times as a student and I've actually lived in Japan for seven years as well. So um, Japan is a fantastic place to go and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Great, and then Patrick and Marcy. Hi everyone, I'm Patrick Navin and I teach digital photography at Green River College. I will also be the instructor who goes with all of you to uh, Hachioji, which is the city we'll be in. And I'm totally looking forward to it. This hiatus of a couple of years has been driving me crazy and I cannot wait to get back. And just as a side note, my son was accepted into the JET program. So he left two weeks ago and it was in quarantine for 14 days. And now he's gone to the city that he'll be teaching in and he's sending photographs and it's just like, if I had here, I'd be pulling it out because I want to be there so bad. Yeah, so it's good to see everyone and I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Marcy. Hello everyone, I'm Marcy Sims and I teach a lot of the English classes at Green River College and I'll be teaching the creative writing online portion of your Japan study abroad, which is very fun and we'll coordinate with Patrick's assignments. So you'll be able to both capture in visually and in writing and creative writing some of your experiences in Japan. And I'm really je jealous of you guys going to Japan because it was one of the best trips of my life um, a couple of years ago, just so beautiful. Pre-pandemic I went, it was amazing. And also I was an exchange student in my college um, to Europe and it was a life-changing experience. So I highly recommend it. Great, well, thanks everyone again for being here. Um, I'm gonna just start by giving a brief overview of the Wixa Consortium and sort of how the study abroad model works. Then I'll turn it over to Patrick and Marcy to talk about the exciting elements of the program, what the classes are gonna be like. I think Patrick has some photos to show you. After they talk about the content, Mark and I will cover more of the logistics with you. So how to apply, uh, things about cost, scholarships, eligibility, timelines, all that will come towards the end. Feel free though at any time to um, type questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll try to keep an eye on all that and address them at a point that makes sense. So um, I'm going to share my screen just a moment. Oops, didn't want to do that. All right. So if you don't mind looking at it um, with the panel on the side, hopefully that's okay. Uh, so welcome again to the info session. Um, Green River has been hosting the Japan Study Abroad Program for well, at least 10 years now. Um, we try to run it every fall. And this year, you know, with COVID, we made some adjustments and we thought, let's try to run it in spring of 2022, just to allow those students who've been planning on it for the past years a chance to go. And then we will offer it again in fall 2022. So it's hopefully going to run twice in the next calendar year. And then after that, we'll just proceed back to our normal fall annual schedule. All right. So um, as I said, we'll do the overview, talk about classes, <clears throat> and then get into those fun logistics. 
So just a note about WICSA, because you might hear us mention this WICSA acronym. It stands for the Washington State Community College Consortium for Study Abroad. So if you're here, it means you attend a college that's part of this consortium. So every year, um, WICSA combines our students together to offer one or two programs every quarter. And so if you apply and you're accepted, you will be participating alongside students from any of our 17 member colleges. So we've got Bellevue, Whatcom, Shoreline, Edmonds, Clark, Green River. So um, quite a few of us. And um, we always send one lead faculty member from a Wixa college. So Japan is a Green River lead faculty, like Patrick said, that's him. And then um, there's usually one class taught or, or um, guest lectured in by local faculty in the host country. All the classes are taught in English, um, unless it's a language class, which we don't have on this program, but if you were um, going to France, you'd have a French class. So um, it's our programs are open to all student types. So regardless if you're international, running start, um, non-traditional, we accept all types, as long as you're 17 years old by the time the program begins. So you can apply when you're 16, as long as you're going to turn 17 before you get on the airplane. <clears throat> and so the way our model works is you stay registered or enrolled in your home college. So if you go to Shoreline, you're going to pay tuition to Shoreline, your classes are going to go on your Shoreline transcript, and you'll pay the program fee to Green River College. And so when you come back, classes are right there on your Shoreline transcript. It's like you never left. So it's a really nice model that we hope makes the process a little easier for you. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to say as an intro. And I want to turn it over now to Patrick and Marcy to talk more about the classes and what you can expect to experience. So I'll just need to stop sharing. And Patrick, now you should have the option to share your screen. Yes. Okay. I'll do that in just a second. I saw in the chat, somebody was asking about the a Japanese placement test. And Megan mentioned that we don't have a Japanese or a language class. And we'll say a language class per se. As part of the humanities class, there's four weeks of Japanese instruction. So it's not a real Japanese class where you would get credit for Japanese 101 or something like that but you will have language experience. And so that placement test is for the instructors there to divide beginning students from the more advanced students. And that way they can kind of uh, make sure that everyone's at sort of on the same page with the instruction that they're, they're giving out. So there is language, but it's not a language class. How's that? Okay, so I'm gonna do a um, uh, PowerPoint. So I'll share my screen here. And... Let's see. Is that right? Oh, sorry. Forgot to look down there. Okay, here we go. Everyone can see it okay? Okay. All right. So that first one was just a welcome. And um, this photograph right here is like the second night that we're on campus and it's the welcome party. And I, I have this right up front because I want you to see that in with all of the American students are quite a few Japanese students. And the beautiful thing about this program is that our host univer university, Kogakuen, has a program called the Campus Attendance Program. And they ask for Japanese students from their university to volunteer, to help you, assist you, be friends with you, whatever kind of, uh, let's say you want to go to the grocery store, but you're not all that well uh, equipped to read Japanese. So they might go with you to help you understand which one is chicken and which one is pork or salmon, whatever it might be. So this program, they usually have 80 or so uh, Japanese students that volunteer to, to be your friends. And that works out to be typically like three or four per American student. So it's a really cool uh, program that they offer and it makes for a lot of fun with the extracurricular activities. 
Oops, let's see. Oops, let me back up one. So as you can see, um, here are four of the GRC uh, consortium students, and they're just so happy to be in Japan. They are just jumping for joy. So, And here's an example of a Japanese and American students off. And a lot of times they'll get together on the weekends and just you know, say, hey, let's go do this. Let's go see a movie. Let's go visit a shrine, whatever it might be. So lots of opportunity for friendships to develop. Um, I'll kind of summarize what this is so we don't have to spend a whole lot of time reading, but basically this program and like all the study abroad programs, they have a way of changing who you are and your outlook on life. And, and basically they, I think I can honestly say, make you a better person because of all the different experiences that you have while you're on the study abroad programs. So this particular person, Although they said they were challenged, um, they became a whole different empathetic person. So a very good experience all around. For the academic program, we have Marcy who will be teaching the creative writing class and that's an online class. And then in uh, Hachioji, the Hachioji campus, I'll be there teaching the humanities class and the digital photography class. So I'm gonna have Marcy uh, talk about her writing class and then I'll come back and talk about the other two. Thanks Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, super excited to teach this again. Uh, we, like Patrick said, we were sad about the hiatus and even though I didn't get to be there in person with the students in the Japan program in 2019, I felt like I got to know them through their beautiful description of their scenes in Japan and characters and um, some of the companion pieces they were writing to go along with their photography and humanities assignments that they were working on in Japan. So I have customized this creative writing class just for this program. And I got a lot of great feedback from the students from 2019 that I incorporated to make it easier to get things done sort of on your own crazy schedule while you're there doing all kinds of amazing field trips and stuff that you do as a class, but also on your own so that it works better with your schedule. But also it's very coordinated to the assignments you're doing in Japan and creative writing with the Japan lens where you learn Japanese haiku and you'll learn a little bit about character studies and, and setting description so you can be describing what you're doing and what you're seeing in Japan. So it's super exciting. And what I'm gonna do is just in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and post for you, see if it'll let me do it, might not. Um, let's see if I have screen share. Oh, nope, I can't. Let me just try to do a chat post after this. I'll show you guys. It's just basically four major assignments um, that you'll work on. So you'll have like weekly discussion posts where you're posting something about a scene description of one of your trips in Japan or one of the field trips or a poem about it, or a character study of someone you meet in the Japan program, whether it's a, another American student or a Japanese student. Um, and then you'll just do that kind of once a week and give feedback to each other. And then we'll be writing some poems that I teach you how to do, like how to do a classic 575 Japanese haiku. And then you'll find some beautiful object and write a haiku about it. And then you'll be doing, you'll be building up to expanding one of your scenes one of your description scenes of a person or of a place to either a short fiction story that you make up or you can do memoir, which basically is telling what's happening to you, some autobiographical little piece of one of your days in Japan with your classmates. So you can actually write about that using description, using, using setting, using all the stuff we learn in creative writing. So it's very customized to your class and your experience in Japan. And later you'll have your own little mini kind of pieces of a memoir for your memories of that trip to Japan. Maybe you can even publish it later. Um, and the last thing we'll do is pick one piece that you wrote all quarter to share with the Green River Academic Showcase. Even if you went to another, even if your home college is a different college, they'll get to see your work that you're doing in Japan. And that'll be um, optional to be anonymous or with your name. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun. And I'm really looking forward to being able to do it again soon. 
That's true. Okay. And I'll put it in the chat for you as soon as I get it. Okay, great. Thank you, Marcy. I'm going to move on to the next slide. And, uh, we'll look at a few of the images and I'll talk about the two classes, humanities and, and digital photography as we look at these photographs. So this is on the Kogakuen University Hachioji campus. They also have a, a campus in uh, Shinjuku in Tokyo. And that campus is for the um, juniors and seniors the Hachioji campus where we'll be staying is for the freshman and sophomore. So essentially they're, they're kind of all in the same age range as uh, most of the students who go on this study abroad experience. The building we're looking at uh, on the ground floor is the bookstore to the right and copy machine study area. Above that is a two floor uh, cafeteria. And then above that would be the offices and the university club rooms, which I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the format for our time there, we're going to have in the classroom at the Hachioji campus on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday and Friday. Okay, so four days in the classroom, where I'll be teaching the humanities. Uh, you'll also have the Japanese language and then the digital photography class. Every Wednesday, we'll meet at the downtown train station and we'll go off and do our field work field trip um, and that'll be to different areas um, maybe 60 percent will be in the city of tokyo we'll also go out to yokohama and some of the other surrounding areas so that you get a, a nice diverse experience and with those field trips um, we're going to be looking at historical and contemporary and maybe even somewhat futuristic um, elements of the Japanese culture and society. Uh, here's another shot of the campus. And this was like super early in the morning before most of the students arrived. So, so it looks a little bit empty, but they have mm, probably about 4,000 students that attend this particular campus. So it does get pretty busy when everybody's around. Uh, and as you also see that it is a modern campus, they have gone through and, and uh, taken down all but one of the older original buildings and have built these beautiful modern um, classroom buildings for us to use. Here's inside one of the classrooms and you know it has everything we need. Um, in fact, typically they're more spacious than the ones I teach at, at GRCC. And so, you know, I like going there, it's a good experience. Okay, so for the humanities class, the first four weeks of the quarter will be the Japanese language. And like I mentioned, it'll be, you'll be split up into the beginning level and the more advanced level. So if you do not have any Japanese language experience, it's not a problem every year. Uh, I would say about a third of the students have little to no Japanese and, and it's, it's, it's not really detrimental. I mean, obviously it's great if you do have Japanese language experience, but if you don't, you have this four week sort of mini workshop class where you will learn basic expressions and greetings and you know how to conduct yourself. And if you do uh, end up in the advanced class, then it's gonna take off from basically uh, an intermediate level and get into the more advanced things. And uh, this is from, um, I believe the advanced or the intermediate uh, class. So you can see that they're working on uh, different elements of the language here. And as part of the, the actual humanities part of it, the learning about the culture, there will be different experiences. Um, as you can see, they're working with the ink and the brush on this particular assignment. Uh, I know that we have done uh, Japanese game shows in the past. Um, Japanese television, movies, music, anime museum, um, obviously the shrines and temples. Like I mentioned earlier, it's from the past into the future that we try to cover. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice range of experiences. Here's a photograph of a student working on her digital photography assignment. And so this is on one of the field trips, which you know, every Wednesday we're, we're out and about somewhere. And on these field trips, in addition to being exposed to different parts of the area, 
we're, look, we're working on the assignment. So whatever the photo assignment might be for that week or whatever the creative writing assignment might be, this is your chance to work on it and essentially collect um, all the information you might, you might need for your story or your poem or to do your photography. And so that all you have to do is get back into the classroom during lab time and uh, do the editing part of it. In digital photography, that's another class that is a beginning level. So you do not have to have any experience. You do have to have, a, I guess I'll say a real camera. So no phones or, or tablet cameras. It has to be either um, a DSLR or a point and shoot camera. And we will work with camera operation, uh, point of view, composition, lighting, creativity, um, creative Photoshop techniques, and then we'll finish up with a, a final portfolio. And all of the assignments are based on the field trips where we're going. So you have uh, plenty of source material to work on while you're out enjoying the city. And um, I guess the, the most important thing for me is having a great lunch. Okay, So we're back on campus here. This is the cafeteria. And as you can see, there are photographs of all the different foods. They have it uh, designed in such a way so that there's like a, a rice bowl bar, there's a noodle bar, there's an a la carte bar, a salad bar. And the food is really quite inexpensive. Um, I don't think I've ever paid more than $5 for lunch at the cafeteria. And typically it's like three to, three to $4. This is inside the cafeteria, and you can see that it does get rather busy. Um, they have the cafeteria open essentially from 11 till about 1.30 or 2. And our classes will go to about 12.30, and then we'll have our lunch break and then uh, resume later, uh, typically around 1.30 to quarter to 2. And this is the parking lot at the university. We can see that all the students arrive by bicycle. And when it's just before class time, you have to have your senses about you because they're flying every which way. So you just kind of want to make sure you're always watching where those bikes are coming from and where they're going. Part of my responsibility in the program is to make sure that you're having a good experience, everything's going well. And so essentially whatever I can do to make this experience a good one for you, that's what I do. And this particular student had a tendency to kind of sit near me when we would be on the train going on the field trips. And so, you know, it was sort of like office hours on the train kind of a situation. And we talk about lots of different things, but you know, it's, I, I'm not, just a teacher when I'm there, I'm, I'm kind of everything, right? So whatever it is that you wanna talk about, that's what we talk about. And a lot of times it's those experiences that some of the, I mean, there's so much information that, that things come out that make the difference between um, a truly enjoyable experience and one that's maybe, you know, so, so. So don't be afraid to ask me anything. Here we are on some of the field trips, field work. And as you see, uh, you do have to be willing to pose for the group portrait because we do that whenever we go to a new location. And this is because I do a lot of um, photographs to put on Facebook so that all of your family and friends can share the experience. And uh, it's amazing how much the people respond to that and how much they enjoy seeing what it is that we're doing. This area is um, kind of like the Pike Place Market of um, Tokyo. And so it's kind of a fun area to explore, lots of good food and shops and things like that. And this one is in Shibuya, it's the Scramble Crossing, where I'm, you probably all know about that. So with our field trips, like I've mentioned a number of times, you know, the first slide we saw was at a uh, shrine, temples, and then we go into neighborhoods that are more modern and then into the super modern hip kind of places as well. 
the experience is not all about in the classroom and doing homework. The university is really good about having us enjoy time together with the Japanese students. So this is a photograph of game night, which is a, a time in the evening that happens about mid quarter where the Japanese students will teach you Japanese games and the American students teach the Japanese students American games. And as you can see, there's some nice treats and drinks and everyone just has a really a, a blast. In fact, the hardest part of the whole job for me is getting everyone to leave after game night. They just wanna hang out and hang out and hang out and hang out. So it's a super fun time. Another fun experience is the cultural exchange where uh, you'll be with groups of Japanese students and you'll talk about different things. In this case, you can see that the American students are showing the American money. Japanese students have a couple of Japanese coins down there, but it could be talking about uh, holidays, uh, the money, the food, movies, music, whatever it might be. So it's just a, a way to dig deeper into the experience of the different cultures. This is a photograph from one of the campus buildings. It shows you the neighborhood. And if you look out over those houses, there's probably an apartment building that the university is going to make available for us and that's where you will be living. So you're no more than a 20 minute walk typically, sometimes like maybe five minutes away. It just depends what they can uh, find for us. But it's a very residential neighborhood that the university is in. And the campus is located approximately 20 minutes from downtown by bus. And downtown Hachioji has two major train lines that service it uh, going every which way. So it's, it's a nice location, you know, it's Hachioji itself is about the size of Seattle. Okay, so even though it looks like it's very woodsy, it is um, a, a large city. This is a typical Japanese apartment building like the ones that students will be in. And I have this photograph in here because I want you to see right off the bat, you do not have a drying machine. You, your apartment will have a washer and they'll have a bunch of other stuff but drying machines are not a very common item in Japan. So you will be hanging all your laundry out on the sunny days. That's how we actually tell the weather. Is it raining or sunny? Well, you just look and see if the laundry's out or not. Here's inside. And if you can kind of see in the top left corner, there's a heating and air conditioning unit. So you will have heat for when it's cold and some nice strong air conditioning for the, the hotter times of the quarter that were there. And this is a, a kitchen, this was actually mine the first year. And so it, it looks really tiny and small, but it's only because it's made for a, you know, just one person. Uh, you'll have roommates. And so your stove, like you have a, a burner there, you'll typically have a stove that has two or three burners. But if you look around in the photograph, you'll see there's like a sponge and a dishwashing liquid and spatulas and plates and cups and knives and forks and there's pots and pans, all of that's provided by the university. You also will have a microwave oven, a refrigerator. You will not have a regular oven like for baking cookies kind of a thing, because um, that's not a very common item as well. But um, all the things you need to cook in your apartment will be there for you. Here's a photograph of a bedroom and this one's a tatami. You'll be supplied with a futon and pillow and a comforter. And they will all have areas where you can store your suitcases and your clothes. Everybody who goes finds a way to make the experience feel good for them. And some people are more outgoing, some people are less so, but Japan offers so much that you almost have to try harder not to have a good time than to have a good time. Okay. 
This is a photograph of Hachioji, and you can see that that main core, a lot of tall buildings. The city has about 20 higher education institutions, so there are a lot of young people that are moving around through the city because of so many of the university campuses that are here. And obviously you can tell this is from higher up, it's about a 40 minute train ride to um, areas where you can go hiking. And when you're up hiking, they have these open vistas where you can see throughout all the way to Tokyo. And speaking of Tokyo, you know, every weekend, except for one when we do an all day field trip on a Sunday with the Japanese students, all the other weekends, you're going to be free to explore. So this is in Harajuku, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. And so you, you might choose to go there. You might choose to go to Sky Tree up to the observation deck, or you might choose maybe Tokyo Tower, or you might choose to go, oh, sorry. If wherever you go that's real touristy, you will find a cute character that you can do selfies with. It's just a given. <laughs> or you might go to a shrine or a temple, and if you're lucky, there might be some kind of festival going on. Sometimes on field trips when we do, um, our field trip to Meiji Shrine, we actually have experienced Shinto wedding processions. So it's, it's just amazing what can pop up out of anywhere. And after you're out and about for a long time, of course, you're going to want to eat some food, right? So I'm sure you've heard how expensive Jap Japan can be. And it's true and it's not true. It's, it's, it's as expensive as you want it to be. And if you look in the bottom right corner, you can see there's a, a nice set there for $11, which has a rice omelet, um, some meat patties, a salad, soup. And this is in a tourist area where the prices are higher. You can easily, easily find a good meal for under $10, right? Or you can find a good meal for $1,000. It just depends on which store you walk into, right? But they all have the food displayed and the prices with it. So you know pretty much what you're getting into. Or you may be interested in some uh, handmade noodles at a ramen shop or soba. But whatever it is you choose to eat, I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it. It'll be nice and hot and steamy fresh. To this day, I hear from former students and they're talking about still being in touch with the Japanese students that they met the campus attendance. And just last year, last summer, uh, one of the American students was invited to the wedding of one of the campus attendants. And so, you know, this, you're looking at meeting people that potentially could be lifelong friends. You know, and that's pretty cool to say, hey, I have friends in Japan, I can go visit, or they can come over and visit me. And of course, we have to have our Mount Fuji photograph, right? And then last night on campus, like we had the welcome party, we had the farewell party. And again, it's a time to get together with the campus attendants and all your new friends and say, see you next time. Okay, I think that is it, yep. Okay, so if you have questions. Patrick, there was a question in the chat earlier about renting bicycles, about how much it costs. Um, I would not rent a bicycle, I would buy the bicycle because you can find, in fact, you can even use Craigslist, but you can find used bikes for well under $100. Uh, you will need to get insurance and a license and a university parking permit for your bike. You saw that parking lot, right? Just like on our campus, you have to have a parking permit. Uh, but all of those things are relatively inexpensive. But I do want to warn you that they do have police do bicycle checks. In other words, you might be riding down the street and there will be uh, three or four or five police and they'll kind of motion you over and they'll check to see, do you have that license? Do you have that insurance? Okay, so you do want to be legal about that and follow the rules, of course, for riding on the street. Okay, other questions?
in the chat, they're asking, is the J JR Rail Pass worth it? Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that we'll have a one week break during the program. So the first week, I'm sorry, I was thinking of the fall term. Um, about after the first month, there'll be a week break. So yeah, if you plan on traveling anywhere, I would definitely get the JR Pass. And most everybody does. They, go down to um, Kyoto or up to Hokkaido. So yeah, it's it's a definitely a good value. And you do have to buy it here. You cannot buy it in Japan. So make sure that if you're interested, you do the research, buy the pass here, and then you activate it once you get there. I know for the Olympics, they did allow uh, people to buy the JR Pass in country, but it was at a higher price. And I don't know if that was a limited time or if they'll continue it, but uh, I definitely recommend doing it and doing it, purchasing it before you, you go to Japan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it'll be cheaper. And we'll we'll verify whether it's still that way or not. When we do the orientation, we'll have that information. But yeah. And, you know, it's a one week break. You can buy the seven day pass and uh, I mean, there have been students who they, I'm not exactly sure why they do this, but they were more concerned with how far they could go every which way rather than actually getting off the train and, and seeing the, the different sites. Okay. Other questions? There's one. So they're asking uh, you, about when when do classes oh what when do classes start? I don't know if that's time of day or time of year, and then traveling in the break week. Okay, so classes will typically start around 9:30 in the morning. And then when we're doing the first four weeks when we're doing the Japanese lessons as well, um, they'll go to like five in the afternoon. Once Japanese is done, then we'll be done by two for sure. And I see someone asked about a skateboard. Um, you know, no one's really brought that up before. And quite honestly, I've, I hardly ever see anyone on campus with a skateboard and it might be because they're not allowed on campus. They have a whole different, you know, what, what's allowed and what's not. I saw one during the break week, um, you can either travel alone or in a group and students have done both of them. Some people just want to get away and experience it for themselves and others. You've made so many friends, uh, you know, it's like four or five, six of you want to go to Kyoto or wherever it might be. Question about quarantine. Do we need to quarantine for two weeks upon arrival? Uh, I just read like two days ago that later this month, they're dropping it down to three days for business travelers. So I don't know. I'm going to say we don't know. And what it is now could be vastly different by the time we would depart. So it's just going to be kind of a wait and see attitude on that one. Yeah, I wish I wish it would be like gone. So no quarantine. That'd be great. Uh, essentially, I see a ski slope. In spring quarter, I don't think there will be any skiing. If it were, um, if it were fall quarter, I'm not sure the snow would be there yet. It's usually late November when I start to see snow on Mount Fuji. Yeah. Um, but if there is, yeah, I mean, you can go anywhere in Japan that you want to. Yeah. So it's just. You know, where, wherever you want to go, you have the money, you can do that. Uh, Hachioji is the city that we're going to be in. I'm just trying to read these. Uh, yeah. And it's about an hour west of Tokyo. And the trains that uh, service Hachioji go into Shinjuku Station, which is on the west side of, this, of Tokyo. Um, for after the quarter, you're on a 90 day visa. We're not going a, on a student visa. We're going on a tourist visa. So you only have 90 days and it, 
it kind of depends on the actual schedule. It might be that you're up against that 90 day limit. Um, so to answer that question, can you stay after? We just kind of have to see how that's gonna shape up with the schedule. Um, if so, it's probably just for a couple of days. And Patrick, if we can remind them that um, KU prefers that if you're gonna stay after, you should be met by a family member. Right. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So they they don't you're allowed to travel totally independently during the break week in the middle of the program, but at the end, um, they don't want you just disappearing off into the country. They feel very responsible for you and your well being. So only you can only stay after if a family member, like a parent or aunt or uncle, is coming to meet you. Um, so many questions. The other was the apartments are totally public apartments and there's no building attendant and no curfew, but there is quiet hours, I think after 10 o'clock or something. Yeah, it's it's 10 o'clock. Japanese, uh, the apartments are, are uh, university sponsored, right? So they have control over that. Um, the Japanese apartments, you will be living close to regular families. And it's amazing. It's like eight o'clock at night comes around you can hear a pin drop. I mean, you would not even know that any other person in the world exists that's so quiet in those buildings. So you have to be really conscious of the noise that you make. And it's definitely for sure quiet time um, at 10 o'clock. And let's see. There was a question about how much spending money students usually need. Yeah, that's, and again, it'll be based on your spending habits, but two to 3,000 is a good estimate. And, you know, it's so like in 2019, a student, I, another nice aspect about the program is that I mentioned the university club offices. University clubs are a big thing in Japan, and typically the archery club and the kendo club will invite the American students to join in with them while they're there. And one of the students was so in love with Japanese archery, he ended up buying everything, bow, arrows, outfit. He spent almost $2,500 and then shipped it all back home, right? So you can spend typically 2,000, 2,500, or you can spend like $10,000 depending on what you're into, so. Yeah, um, the, all the food is something that you would have to pay for. Yeah, so the uh, cafeteria food, you would pay for that, your breakfast, lunch. Um. Catherine, we'll address scholarships um, later in the presentation, but it sort of depends if you're hoping to go in spring or fall. And um, there is still the Green River Scholarship you can apply for and deadlines may be pretty tight for other kind of big level scholarships for spring quarter. Okay, I think um, we should maybe move on and talk about those more logistic -y things. These questions have been great. I hope we're helping you give, get a sense of clarity. If there's anything after the end of today that is not answered, you're welcome to email us at studyabroad at greenriver.edu. And um, we're happy to follow up with you and also your campus coordinators can also uh, be a source of information for you. Um, so maybe Patrick, you could type in some answers to the money change one while I yeah. share my screen and talk about safety okay. and health and some other things. All right, so COVID is of course very much on people's minds still. And uh, at the moment, our plan for the spring quarter program is uh, Patrick and myself and the whole staff team are going to meet on December 6th. And at that time, we will assess the current situation, looking at whatever information and news is available from Japan, 
Um, I'll be meeting with our partners from Kogakuin University on uh, November 15th to get some background information from them. And so on December 6th is our goal to make a decision whether the spring program uh, is safe enough to run based on the information we have at the time. So it was good news that Patrick mentioned that they're lessening the quarantine time, at least for business travelers. So um, our goal is to make an official announcement that week early in December. As you may know, the application deadline for spring quarter is December 1. The payment deadline is December 20th. So we're putting our decision uh, deadline right in the middle of that so we know how many students are interested, but you won't have had to pay the program fee yet. You do pay the deposit by December 1, but if we decide to cancel the program due to COVID uh, in that window in December, we will refund your deposit to you because it's not, it wouldn't be fair you know, if we kept your money and we canceled the program. So um, at the moment we use CDC and State Department travel advisories uh, to assess whether it is safe to run a program. Uh, generally, we don't allow any travel to a level four travel advisory country. And then level three is where we really look to guidance from the State Department. Um, and there are, I have special sources of information that they share um, for example, they fund the Gilman Scholarship, and they have published a list of countries where students are okay to travel to on a Gilman Scholarship and um, within that level three band. So we'll look at that in December and see, does Japan fall in this level three? And then, of course, what is the Japanese government allowing? Um, what does it look like they're going to allow? So we are making these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis for each of our programs. So it's not like a across the board travel policy in general for Wixa, it's looking at each location. Uh, we have to think about quarantine because um, as Coulter asked, you know, if you had to quarantine for two weeks, we don't think that that would be a good value for you, a good use of your time. So if that were the case, we probably would not want to run the program mostly because we want you to have a good quality experience and spend your money in a way that is valuable. We have to think about activity restrictions. So can people gather in large groups in public? Um, what does public transportation rules allow? Can people move out to other cities? Japan is you know, pretty, pretty conservative. So these are all things we're going to consider. Just to let you know, your program fee does include medical insurance that covers COVID. So if you got COVID while you're there, um, it would cover your treatment. You should expect though, that you will need to be vaccinated before going and get tested before leaving and before returning. And that test will be at your own expense. Um, and as I said, the refund would happen. So any questions about COVID? noting that we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but our plan is in four weeks to assess and make an announcement at that time. Well, will less people be accepted due to COVID? Uh, that is an interesting question. No, at the moment, we're not looking at restricting the cap. Our cap for this program is 30 students and we plan to keep it there unless there was some kind of apartment shortage. As I mentioned in the uh, chat earlier, they are asking us for spring quarter to only put two students in an apartment rather than the usual four. So um, what that means actually is I need to let you know that for spring quarter, the cost of the program fee is going to increase a bit because of this new rule that we can only have two students in an apartment. So um, Green River College has found some money that we can uh, subsidize some of that increase. So basically we need twice as many apartments as we usually get. So um, unfortunately that means we have to pay more for housing. So I've already announced this to students who've been accepted into the program, but the cost increase will be $616. So that's 616 added to the 6490 program fee. And I know that that is kind of a big number 
to manage. Um, I'll tell you the actual increase is double that. So Green River is willing to match 50% of that cost increase. And as far as we know, this is just for spring quarter. It's temporary due to the COVID situation. It's actually the landlords through the KU apartment system that would not allow us to have four students in a unit. So um, that is an added cost that is unfortunately out of our control just because COVID has this, you know, concern about housing. So a, um, the type of test would be a COVID PCR test. And um, usually you need that three days before you leave the country and three days before you come back into the country. Um, question about other medical conditions. Yes, the health insurance covers standard medical conditions, treatment if you need to go to the doctor while you're there. Um, a chronic condition, um, there we'll have to double check on that. So you're asking about like pre-existing conditions. Um, usually that is not covered, but um, please email me and let's talk about it because I don't want you to feel like you'll be a, um, not able to go. So only spring has this cost at the moment. Of course, we can't predict what the future is going to bring, but I am planning to ask Coca Quinn staff at my meeting with them in 10 days, um, do they expect that we'll still have to continue this housing rule in fall quarter? So we should know more soon from them, but of course it, it all depends on what COVID does and whether it surges or dissipates. And um, we, we absolutely hope it will go back to normal for fall quarter, but I can't say for sure. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark and let him talk about eligibility and how to apply. And I will monitor the chat while he's talking. All right, next slide, please. The minimum GPA to be eligible to go on the Japan study abroad trip is a 2.5, and you need to be qualified for English 99. Um, you also need to be at least 17 years old when you travel and have a passport at the time of booking your flight, not the departure. Um, and there are more delays now for getting passports if you don't already have one. So I would recommend um, applying for one as soon as possible. Um, they are good for 10 years. So it's good to get the ball rolling, especially if you're planning on, on doing international travel uh, anytime in the future. Um, so when you apply, you would complete an application, which you can find online on our study abroad website, and then get two letters of recommendation. And one of those must be from a professor, instructor, or teacher at your school. Um, we'll also need an unofficial transcript. And then there's a one page personal essay. Next slide. So the process basically is uh, first submitting the application packet, which includes those three, those four things I mentioned, unofficial transcript, two letters of recommendation, the one page essay and the application form. Um, and then we'll uh, set up an interview and meet with you and kind of talk about um, your experience traveling, what your um, reasons are for wanting to study abroad, things like that. If you are accepted, you would then pay a $450 deposit within two weeks of the interview. Um, and that deposit would go towards your um, program fee. And then submit the enrollment paperwork for the, the classes and then um, pay the program fee by the deadline um, and then the tuition for um, the courses you'd be taking. Typically that's about two months before travel. So this is the um, Japan study abroad application on our website. So you can see that the deadlines, both for the application, December 1st, which is coming up in less than a month, or, or and the, uh, the payment deadline, which is December 20th. Um, and then you can continue scrolling down that page and we have all kinds of information and links. If you'd like to schedule an appointment to just ask more in-depth questions, maybe you didn't get to um, ask or get answered on this um, event, we can set up a time to, to talk with you. Um, and we also have a link for the application itself, which you can um, click if you wanna do the next slide. Um, it's right there, the uh, study abroad application. So you can open that up and, and fill it out and then submit it to us. 
Um, all of our contact information is also on that same um, Japan Study Abroad program website. All right, so I want to revisit the discussion about program costs. Um, the overall program fee, which does include group airfare, is $6,490. This gets paid to Green River College. If you have miles or some kind of airfare benefits you want to use, we do have a reduced fee available um, <clears throat> that's just the land only fee and does not include the group flight. So do let me know if you're interested in that. Um, after you apply, you'll be, you'll have your interview. And once you're accepted, we do ask that you pay a $450 deposit to secure your spot in the program within two weeks. So it's not due with your application anymore. Now it's due two weeks after your application. Um, as I mentioned, there is the $616 COVID housing surcharge for this spring quarter that we know of so far. And then tuition is paid to your home college. So depending where you attend, it'll be the rate for 15 credits um, or whatever they charge for study abroad uh, full quarter programs. At Green River, that amount is 1450, but it's, it varies at the different colleges. So please definitely consult with your study abroad coordinator on your campus to ask about the tuition cost. Um, the so before the payment by by December 20th, you need to pay the the um, 6490 plus the 616 housing surcharge. Tuition is not usually due until about um, until February, I'd say depends on your your college calendar. Um, so you um, if you have financial aid, um, we can talk to you about that in terms of. Um, usually we ask then for just 30% upfront and then extend the payment deadline for the balance into later in the next quarter. So we try to be flexible and understanding with those of you who are expecting financial aid contributions. Um, there are other costs included. So um, you will need Photoshop software. I think uh, that's about $99. Then there are books and other supplies you'll need, um, I put an estimate here of $2,500 spending money for all of your food, admissions to field trip sites, transportation on bus or metro, any kind of activities you want to do that require an entry fee. Um, so that's the overall amount. And each um, college um, representative has a budget worksheet that they can send to you that has all these costs itemized. And if you are applying for financial aid, you need to present that document to your financial aid office so that they can assess your total overall need for the quarter because it's higher than your usual need when you're at college. So that you should potentially be eligible for more. Um, I know that if you have excess unused financial aid, in the quarters before or after your study abroad program, that, that money can be saved or pushed you know, towards that quarter for study abroad. So there are a number of different scholarships, um, both at uh, the campus level, state level, and national levels. Um, and they can range from $200 to up to $5,000. Um, so on the Japan Study Abroad website, or just the, the general study abroad website, we have a lot of different options and details about scholarships. Some of the deadlines are you know, nine months ahead of travel, so it might not work for uh, the spring trip, um, but definitely start looking and, and determining whether or not you can apply for some. All right, so um, Green River College does typically give out two $500 scholarships for Green River students. And this is because it comes uh, from our private endowment at the college. I have asked them if they'd be willing or able to make an exception this spring due to that housing surcharge to find out if we can open up this scholarship money to all students who apply and I'm waiting for an answer. So I'm, I'm hoping the answer is yes, because if the answer is yes, what we want to do is actually use the scholarship money and anybody who applies will just distribute it evenly among all of you who apply to help offset that housing increase. Um, that'll be a special opportunity rather than giving out to just two people 
uh, $500. We'd rather sh share the wealth and help everybody out and help you be able to afford that extra housing cost because it was totally unexpected and, and we just learned about this. So for this particular scholarship, um, I will send out the application forms once we decide the program is gonna run. So December 6th, I would, if we announce it's happening, I'll send out that application form and give you about 10 days to submit it back to me. So you'll, you'll know before the December 20th payment deadline if you're going to receive one of these scholarships. And um, as I said, for this one, we hope it'll be available to anybody who applies. And so that means I can't tell you the exact amount. So it's gonna be, you know, say 10 people apply, it's gonna be different than if 15 people apply. I'm just gonna split it equally among everyone to be fair. Um, so you have to have already been accepted into the program. And um, then we also have a foundation. So I don't know if your colleges also might have a foundation that gives out general college scholarships that um, at Green River we do. And so that those application deadlines happen twice a year, once in fall and once in winter. Um, and so that information is on our website, uh, the Green River Study Abroad website in the lower right hand corner has a link to scholarships and they're for not just Green River, but all the ones that we're going to be mentioning here and more. So I definitely encourage you to check out that. I'll type it in the chat. We'll mark as the next slide. And, and just to add on to that, I would also recommend contacting your campus study abroad coordinator or manager just to find out what college uh, specific scholarships might be available to you, um, whether you uh, attend to Green River or another Wixa college. Um, the Gilman scholarships, um, there's two different ones basically with the same name. One is the General Gilman scholarship, which is available to all Pell Grant aid recipients. Um, and that has two specific deadlines. So um, if you're thinking about maybe the fall 2022 Japan trip, this could be um, a scholarship that you can apply for if you do receive a Pell Grant. Um, and then the other Gilman scholarship is the Gilman McCain scholarship, which is available to children of active, active duty military personnel. Um, and that has a rolling application deadline. So you can submit those at any time. So um, these are two, if you do qualify, these are fantastic scholarships um, and definitely contact your study abroad coordinator on campus to get help in learning how to apply for them because they're very wor worth your while. Uh, some general tips about applying for scholarships. Um, do your research and find out what um, scholarships are available as early as possible, because as you've seen, some have um, very specific deadlines um, that can be far away from your actual uh, departure. Um, and then, of course, a lot of them require writing an essay, and it is a process. So you're going to have to write multiple drafts uh, and use the writing center um, at your college to get assistance. Um, think about and be, you know, really reflect on, on why you'd like to, to study abroad um, and how it might impact you and your future goals, both educationally, professionally, and personally. Um, so be unique and highlight your talents, accomplishments, and goals, um, your dreams. Be thoughtful, meaningful, genuine, reflective. Um, really um, show these people that are evaluating these essays who you are and, and why you deserve this, um, this scholarship. Um, explain how it will benefit you your family financially um, and the experience with uh, the rest of your life. I know for me, um, it truly did impact me in, in so many different ways. Uh, and uh, I was always excited to go on a new study abroad trip. It was always uh, worthwhile. I always learned more about myself and the world around me. So you can also uh, use loans to, come, to cover some or all of your study abroad costs. Um, so I'm sure many of you know a loan, uh, you know, is borrowed money that students need to pay back, uh, often with interest. Um, there are federal student loans that require students or their parents to complete the FAFSA form. Um, there are also non-governmental loans or private bank student loans that are uh, available, but they might have higher interest rates. So talk to your uh, financial aid officers on campus and find out if you can use your financial aid or student loans um, for your study abroad costs. Um, we had our financial aid office at Green River put together a uh, uh, financial aid study abroad video. Hopefully we can get this going. Um, and if not, you can find it on our website. Um, so I think I'll just pop the link in the chat if that's okay. Okay. So we'll, yeah. Time. 
So you can watch it on your own time, um, but it has some great, it's really short and uh, very uh, straightforward about how to um, approach finding out how to use financial aid for your study abroad trip. All right, I'm gonna to try to multitask, put that in the chat while I also talk to you. So there's the page and the videos there and some um, frequently asked questions. All right, so to recap, um, this is our last slide and I apologize we're going over time, but the applications, if you want to participate in spring quarter are due December 1st. And um, December 6th is we're gonna have our team meeting to make a decision about the status. Um, December 14th. So if you applied on December 1st, if you waited to the last minute, then that means your deposit would be due December 14th. But cycling backwards, if you apply, say, November 15th, your deposit is going to be two weeks after you're accepted. So hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have a question. And um, December 20th would be when the program fee and housing surcharge are due. So that's that $6,490 plus the 616, unless you are expecting financial aid and you can show us um, the expected award amount from your financial aid office. They are used to sharing letters like that or statements like that with the city abroad coordinators. Um, at that point, then we would just ask you for 30% of your expected contribution with the balance due in February. And February would also be roughly when tuition is due for your 15 credits, depending on your college's deadlines. So every college has slightly maybe different payment deadlines for spring tuition, and that's when it would be due. So your coordinators are gonna be the ones who work with you on registering you for your classes and helping you make payment for those. Uh, Rebecca asked a question. Yes, 6490 does exclude that 450 deposit. So your deposit comes out of the 6490. So actually the amount you're going to be paying December 20th is $6,040 plus $616. Good point. Yes. This, so the deposit is not on top of that program fee. It comes out of it. It gets deducted from it. Thank you for asking that question, Rebecca. All right, so that is all the content we wanted to share with you. Um, acceptance is basically uh, on a first come first serve basis. As long as you meet all of the minimum requirements, as Mark talked about the eligibility requirements, and your campus coordinator feels like after meeting with you that you would you know, be able to handle the um, potential challenges of study abroad and, you know, be a good ambassador for, for your school and for our country, you would be accepted. Um, so it's first come first serve because we have that cap of 30 students. And so I do keep track, like at the moment we have about nine or 10 students signed up for spring. So once we hit 30, then we start our waiting list. So acceptance rate is very high. <laughs> I would say 90% are accepted. You can definitely start applying now. I already have four students who've applied and been accepted for fall 2022. So we are accepting those apps now because we're gonna keep the price the same and um, classes all the same. So the, the deadlines for fall are in June, but as I said, it's capped at 30, so you can apply now. Um, and yes, the spending money does come on top of these program fees. These program fees you pay directly to us to help pay for your housing and all of the coordination of the program and the activities that Patrick mentioned that are included. And then your spending money would be for your food and you just pay that out of pocket while you're there in Japan. Um, yeah, so fall deadlines. Um, I have a brochure, and uh, if any of the WIXA coordinators are on here, if you could confirm for me whether... The website says June 1st for the application deadline, yeah. June 1st, 2022, and then the payment is June 22nd, 2022. Yeah, I think it's published on our website as well. Um, okay, so... Any other questions? I know um, people are having to go because it's past two o'clock and that's fine. So I will stop sharing my screen. So I can see you all again. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming today, 
for your great questions, for your interest in this program. Um, as Patrick highlighted, you know, it, it's really an amazing program that students get so much out of personally, academically, professionally. And um, we hope that you'll be able to go. And um, we hope that we'll be able to send a group in spring. So um, if you want, you can follow up with me on email uh, or Mark. And um, I will send out these slides and the recording to all the WIXA coordinators to distribute among the interest lists. And if you did chat me or private chat me your email address, I'll send it to you there. Um, so I think with that, we will close out and say goodbye. Hi, everyone.